Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar this afternoon. My name is George Florentine. I'm the VP of Technology at Flatirons Digital Innovations, and uh, we're very happy to have you with us here today on this webinar on best practices for healthcare providers, uh, sponsored by the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, Hospital Council. So I want to thank them for providing an opportunity for us to share our best practices. Before we dive in, I wanted to do some brief intros. Uh, I'm George speaking that good looking young gentleman on the left. And then the two better looking gentlemen are uh, Brad Ricks, who's a colleague of mine here in Boulder, who uh, has done a number of projects on data archiving and is one of our lead architects. And my colleague in the Dallas area, Frank Hughes, who's got a deep experience base in healthcare, both on the um, customer provider side, patient side, and also in IT. So the three of us will be chatting with you today. I'm very excited about the opportunity to talk to you about some of the best practices we've developed. So we'll we'll dive in. Okay, today our agenda is really focused on, first off, defining what data archiving is. There's a lot of different definitions out there, so we thought it would be helpful to give you what kind of our definition is. Um, what particular types of applications and data we see healthcare providers archiving? Most importantly, what are the benefits for our customers and our partners in the healthcare uh, industry, whether you're a clinician, whether you're working in compliance, um, whether you're on the finance side, and, and of course, IT supporting all those functions. So we've got uh, discussions on what we see are benefits for all those different aspects to the business. And then we'll talk about some best practices. Um, Brad will lead this conversation on what we've seen in the area of data integrity, on security, functionality of the archive, and then Frank will I'll wrap us up with some common questions and some things he's seen as he's been talking to our, our customer and healthcare partners. Let's start on what we see going on in terms of the whole application lifecycle. We see customers starting with applications that are typically created in the, in the business. They're doing ideation, project creation, building the application, and then it kind of transitions into uh, the bottom area, which is typically maintained by IT, and they do deployment and they do maintenance. Uh, eventually, they'll start doing infrastructure refresh. And over time, a few years, several years, a decade, two decades, what we see is this ever increasing burden in the IT organization of an application inventory. Uh, it ends up costing the, the company more and more every year to maintain these applications. They'll have um, domain experts and technology experts that may leave the company. We've seen customers who have applications that are not even quite sure what they do anymore. Um, I know that sounds uh, kind of strange, but if you've run an application for 25 years and it's been across multiple technology refreshes, that can actually be a problem. And so we see this arrow gets bigger and bigger um, with less value to the organization, more IT cost. So we see this data and application life cycle across a number of our customers. And what we see happening is that over time, it takes more and more of the IT spend to just run the business. And our research and talking to our customers, we see that up to 70% of their annual IT budget is basically just spent keeping the lights on. And in that situation, IT is, is not valued by the business. Um, there's not competitive advantage from the IT uh, provisioning. Uh, they end up having to do this large spend just to keep the lights on. And there's an ever increasing spend in the business to say, wow, I'm, I'm spending more and more money and I'm actually getting less value. So it creates a lot of conflict between the business and IT. And what we see are sort of forward thinking, leading edge uh, customers and partners in healthcare is they're rechanging that model and they're looking to uh, retire archive applications. And this frees up money. So you see this uh, pie on the right looks much more interesting. They can take money and put it back in innovation. They can take operational money that was just spent doing uh, maintenance and build new applications. And so this leads to competitive advantage. It makes uh, IT and the business more business partners um, and in general speeds up the ability to get into new markets it improves the quality of service that you provide uh, to your uh, patients or to your partners in your in your healthcare practice. And um, both IT and business end up providing better value to the leadership team of the company. And so 
really that that's that's the if you look at the major driving goal uh, that we see in most of our um, partners and customers, it's really this desire to improve the competitive advantage, to really um, provide great cost recovery, improve quality of care to their patients because they're spending more time on new applications, more time on innovation, less time on maintaining legacy applications that may have outlived their usefulness. So I want to, before we go into details on, on what we've seen, we want to talk about what is data archiving. And so we see this sort of uh, dichotomy in the market where people will say, oh, I'm just going to do long-term storage. Um, I'm just going to put it into my backup, or maybe I'll put it into some uh, disaster recovery environment. They don't expect to ever get at it, and in a timely fashion, it's basically the file and forget tool. And we, we find people say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm done uh, thinking about that. And what we typically say to them is, well, really, um, you're missing out on um, some opportunities and you're increasing risk. And so we talk to people and say, you really ought to think about um, data archiving. So our definition of that is migration of static data out of production systems or outdated legacy applications into an archiving platform. And the important uh, requirement for a lot of this data is that you still need to get at it. You may have a, a legal requirement, you may have a regulatory requirement, it might be a request uh, of information, it might be a rack audit, and you have to get at this data and you have to get at it in a relatively timely fashion and you absolutely have to be able to get at it. We've seen customers who have used their backup strategy as their long-term retention policy, they have a need to go get the data and the backup no longer works. And that can cause very significant uh, business exposure financially and risk um, to the to the company. So th that's that's not a great approach. So the first thing I, I want to talk to you about is, is some of the things when we chat with people, um, we'll say, hey, um, you know, we see there's an opportunity for you to improve how you run your business. Um, you can do some cost recovery. And, and some of our, uh, our partners in healthcare will say, well, really, um, this application isn't broken. It isn't used much, and therefore, you know, why, why change something that's not broken? And they say, we're just not going to do anything. We might turn off our maintenance for our expensive databases. Um, you know, we might put it on um, hardware that's not too expensive because we've already capex the hardware. And so, um, you know, do nothing is zero risk. And we say, well, if you think through this, it, it's certainly understandable that that might be your first thought. But what we see when we talk to people and we work with our customers and partners is you're not looking at um, an assessment of applications. So you as IT are providing less and less value to the business. And so business loses faith in IT. Let um, me go out and create shadow IT organizations in order to move their needs forward. That always ends up with problems down the road. Um, they are running on aging infrastructure. And so obviously if you're running on, we've seen customers who have one full-time person and all they do is they spend time on eBay trying to buy old hardware because they realize that they can't buy the hardware new if they have a hardware failure in a disk drive or a controller, um, they can't run the app anymore. So they're basically doing the equivalent of, you know, looking in, uh, you know, basically hardware junkyards to try and keep their applications running. That obviously eventually isn't going to work. And as I mentioned before, uh, some people will use backup technologies. And as we all know, uh, backups frequently fail, especially if they've not been accessed in a long time. And then there's huge risk. You fail an audit, it may, eventually uh, result in you not being able to provide um, your services in a region or a state, uh, maybe lots of uh, financial implications for a failed audit. So really expensive to the business. And so really we see that doing nothing is actually quite high risk for all these reasons. When we start doing this application assessment, uh, the world gets much better. Uh, we see that we look at applications, we can right size those applications. We see a lot of our customers doing lift and shift going from on-prem, older technology platforms into cloud-based, whether it's public or public-private or private clouds. And this is a great opportunity to think about application decommissioning and data archiving. Um, you get away from these inefficient infrastructure refreshes where you're having to go again, find old hardware or trying to run on op uh, outdated operating systems. But we've seen customers who are running on aged operating systems and then someone will come out with what's called a, a zero day uh, security hole and you actually can't fix it without upgrading the operating system. So now you've got a mission critical app 
for your uh, data retention and business continuity, you've got a zero day risk and compliance says, oh my gosh, we can't be running with a zero day risk. And IT says, well, I can't fix this because I'm running on an old version of Windows NT or an old version of MVS and I can't actually apply a patch. And so now IT gets in this very uh, you know, bad position. Uh, compliance gets in a very bad position because they have to go up to the leadership team and say, we've identified a zero day risk. Um, IT doesn't know how to fix it without a very significant refreshing infrastructure. And now we have to go and we may have to talk to regulatory agencies. We may have to talk to our customers and tell them we have the zero day security risk and we can't quickly fix it. And that, that's really a bad place to be um, as an IT provider and as a business. Um, business and IT end up not aligned on the application value and there's really no governance. And so things just continue to get slower and slower and slower. So um, really application assessment we think is very important. And so if you look at the type of data that healthcare providers will archive, we see it in a number of places. We see people doing a lot of work with EMRs and EHRs, whether they're migrating from older uh, solutions to, to newer solutions, whether you're, you're migrating up to an Epic or to a Cerner or to some other system, you still have information in these old EMRs that you need to maintain for uh, continuity with your, uh, your customer uh, and your patients. Uh, patient and accounting systems, obviously, you need to be able to go back and continue to do AR burn down um, to collect uh, money as you're owed, but you want to get off an old system. We see some of these past systems that cost people millions of dollars a year and they're desperate to recover that cost. Um, HR systems are part of the deal. We see this a lot when um, we'll, people will do um, mergers and acquisitions. They acquire a number of clinics, they acquire other hospitals, and all those HR systems need to be consolidated. You have people that are coming over, you're putting them in a new payroll system, you're putting them in a new benefit system, but uh, you may need to keep some of that old data. Homegrown systems, obviously, um, are all over the place. We still have, see lots of people that are running and mostly financial uh, side of the house, running in mainframes. We see people trying to do data center consolidation, again, moving to the cloud. We've seen people said, hey, you know, we're spending $5 million here in this data center. We have to get out of the data center, but we can't because no one knows how to run this MBS, uh, you know, uh, base operating system solution that's running kicks and no one knows how to maintain it. And so now we're stuck holding onto a building we want to get rid of because of one application. So that's all really good motivation for us to um, get to these new systems. So if we look at the size of the business that benefit from this, we see really value across a whole variety of, uh, of folks in your organization. First of all, clinicians, if you've been involved in any migration of EMRs and EHRs, a lot of the new systems will only allow you to take a year or two of data. Um, that's almost always not enough. Someone comes in and says, hey, um, you provided me with some healthcare service for my a broken collarbone 10 years ago and for either a HIPAA requirement or something, I need to see what that care was. And so you have to have that data. Um, and that allows you to both uh, provide better patient care and also um, you know, continue to provide value without having to say to the patient, hey, I'm sorry, we don't understand how to treat you because we, we don't see that data from five years ago. You've re-injured your shoulder, but we can't look at the old data, so we don't know what to do with you. Obviously, on the compliance side, someone comes for a request of information, a release of information, and they say, I want to go back. Anything you've ever provided for me as a patient or anything that a provider has provided um, or anything that has been done at a facility, and we need to be able to respond to those audits well. So the, the folks in compliance um, and health information management are really excited about these opportunities to get these older archive systems into an easier access technology stack. Um, I already talked a little bit about finance, ability to reduce costs. We see, uh, you know, uh, CFOs coming around to IT and the business and saying, we're still spending a lot of money on uh, bricks and mortar at old data centers. We're spending a lot of money on uh, operating systems and databases. We're spending a lot of money maybe to lease uh, some software. And we want to put that money into strategic projects. And so finance gets really excited about this. And then finally, um, IT really likes this because no one in IT likes to be presented uh, with a requirement to provide value and then they can't do it because they don't understand the technology anymore or the hardware um, has failed. And so I IT has really responsive to this because it allows them to provide better value to the, the business, which you know everyone in IT is always feeling like, hey, we're, we're kind of the low person on the totem pole, we can never provide enough value. Um, and so th this really helps IT become more of a business partner. 
which, which everyone likes. So that's kind of the, the high level overview of what we see going on in the market. Um, at this point, I wanted to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Brad, who's been uh, leading and architecting a number of our healthcare solutions over the last uh, five years or so. And uh, Brad will walk us through some of the kind of tips and tricks that his team have developed uh, over our, our last several years of engagement. So, Brad. Thanks, George. So the first uh, topic was just talking about kind of data integrity because it's important, obviously, the the, the data itself is want to make sure that you've got everything that you had before. So um, we know in healthcare it's very important to not lose you know, any of the data or patients. You don't want to have half a patient record. You want the whole record. So we want to make sure we have a complete system of uh, record of everything on for whatever the data was. So when we typically archive the data, we archive all the data from the source system. So if we're taking a system from a uh, legacy database system, we'll pull all the tables, uh, tables and columns and pull all that out. Uh, and because sometimes we even have the needs where pull it all out and maybe we'll only build reports on some of the data, but at least we have all of the data in case we have a report that we need to build on other data off, off of that as well. Uh, so it gives us, it kind of helps future, future proof that to make sure even if you didn't need some of it now, you might need some of it later. Um, we then do verifications to ensure that we got, we have all that data. So we basically do um, record counts, things to, to ensure that every piece of data that we had before in the old system, we recount it after we bring it into an archive and confirm that we've got the exact same data. And we didn't lose anything. You know, one of the funny things I wanted to share with our, our webinar participants is I've watched your team do this. And frequently, um, you're uncovering kind of flaws that might have crept into the application over the years that there might have been a patch that didn't enforce data integrity. And so I've seen your team say, you know, and I know, you know, this might sound a little scary, but this is sort of the real world of someone says, hey, I've got uh, two million images in the database and they're only hooked up to 1.998 patient records. So we might have 20,000 or 50,000 what we would say orphaned images. So, so how, how does that conversation look with the customer? You say, hey, we've done all our chain of custody integrity testing. We're really looking to make sure we've got everything. And gee, we found out that the source app actually had some kind of software bug or maybe it was a hardware failure or whatever. Uh, how do you handle that kind of dialogue with, with, with your you know, project uh, sponsor or, or the customer right. that you work with? Well, I mean, first, as you did point out, we usually give them the counts and we'll say how many are missing one direction or the other. And we may have pointers to, to images that don't exist or images that don't have pointers to them. So we may have both sides of those. Um, and so we'll do that. And usually we'll replicate that in the legacy application and kind of show the customer to show that it's not just our problem and say, look, look, your old systems can't pull up these records as well. And often the old systems don't actually handle it very well when they're missing. They have produced particular bad error messages. So we can actually provide value because we can then sit, we can then for the images where we might have like in that particular example you gave an image that has a link that's missing, a link, sorry, the image is missing. We can at least provide feedback to the end user and say, you know, this, this image is missing, but there was this pointer to that might be able to enhance the system. In the other direction, we can pr produce a list of files and maybe a separate search or something that has has all those files, the you know the, the 300 files that were orphaned. And usually if you pull those up, typically they're going to have the patient information in them. So it'll, you'll know which patient it was. So we could, we could provide an interface to display those if that's what the customer needed or right. um, to, to, you, to utilize that data. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the, I, I guess, fun, because you and I both love this stuff, um, you know, the, the fun thing is having that conversation with compliance, because when I think we have that conversation with compliance, usually make, it really makes them feel, oh, great. Like, we've really got someone who's looked at our data, and now I actually feel more comfortable because we don't have this 20-year-old, you know, maybe a little bit crufty system. We've had world-class experts look at all our data where there's been a problem. I, I think typically we never change the data, but we can say we actually have a better view of your data than the old system. And so I think initially, you know, when we first started doing this, we talked to the compliance team and they're like, oh my gosh, this is like the end of the world. And we're like, no, you actually now have a better handle on what your data is than before. And they're like, oh yeah, that's great. So when I have an audit, I can actually show this report. It says we've looked at every single record of every single patient. And in cases where we had some, you know, and there, there are always problems in software, but at least we know. And so I think it's been kind of fun to watch that kind of maturation and how the compliance seems to say, okay, now I get it. Now I see the value and now I actually feel better if I, if I get an audit 
I can pull this out of my hip pocket and say, everything's here. Oh, by the way, we, as part of our due diligence of providing great quality of, of care and great quality of infrastructure, we found this issue, we've resolved it. And, you know, and we've never, uh, you know, to my knowledge, um, Frank, we've never failed an audit on the system. Uh, and that, that we're really proud of that, right? Everybody who comes and looks at it comes away saying, and we've, we've worked with some very big healthcare providers and some very big financial services uh, banks, and they are very, very, very interested in data integrity. So I think your team has done a great job of, of proving um, our expertise in that area. So it's been fun to watch. Yeah, and just the last, the last point on there is just that when we do the archives, we typically move the data after it's been read only. Uh, if depending on the kind of system, if you're legacy, we might be able to build, start building the archive ahead of time. But when we're eventually ready to do that, they kind of wait till they're read only, and then we extract the whole data. One of the challenges is if you're trying to get part of a patient record and later say, "Oh, I want to get the remaining part of the patient record," because the legacy systems often intertwine that data all over. So it's best to wait till after your to at least extract it. Right. So that's a good governance tip, right? It's really hard to take something that's 98% in use and say, oh, we'll take the, the 2% later where the 2% might be a spider web uh, touching the whole infrastructure. And right? you don't know the, the legacy system where that might be, right. where the 2% rise. So right. You're having to take the whole thing again. So. Yeah. Uh, so the next, next thing is on uh, security. What we typically do is obviously security is paramount, right, in healthcare industries. I mean, we don't want to have anybody take a chance of accessing the wrong data. So, uh, one of the things we do is most of the archives we built around uh, Active Directory. We integrate with existing Active Directory systems and we make security groups for each of the systems or each of the groups involved. And we typically make those fairly simple. Uh, the legacy systems are often very complex because they have different upgrade groups of certain levels of nursing can update certain fields. And so IT organizations have to maintain, you know, a hundred different user groups uh, in the active directory. But we typically you know, have found that organizations, if they keep it simple, it's much easier for them to maintain. So we might say, since this is read only, they can have access to clinical data or at least most of the clinical data. And if there's some more detailed information like social security numbers and maybe him fish users can see those right and then financial people who have access to that can see financial data and so that's common we'll have three to five groups and it's obviously depending on each customer's model uh yep. on that. And, you know the other thing i just wanted to riff off of that for a minute what, what i've seen your groups do and it's been kind of interesting to watch is you come and you start talking to the customer you start you know very quickly showing them the new user interface experience uh, you maybe find some data, you know, that was a, a, a little bit inconsistent. And then they get all excited and they say, wow, you're, you're going to build me a new EMR. And this is awesome, right? You know, I, I want all my data and I want every feature in the book. I want all the system integrations. I want update. And so, you know, talk to me a little bit about how you had an example here, a really good example to say, hey, you don't need 100 security groups if you're only doing read only and there's only three classes of users. So, so talk to me about, you know, what does that dialogue look like and, how do you, you know, how do you find a champion that says to the customer, hey, it's an archive. It has, you know, these set of user stories are super important, but, you know, you don't want to rebuild a new EMR. First of all, it's super expensive. Secondly, you probably already migrated to a new EMR, a new patient accounting system. So, so how do you, you know, people are like, oh, it's, it's Christmas time. Here's my Brad who knows everything about this. And I just keep that giving him requirements and then he'll come back at some point and have a brand new system. And then, you know, obviously that doesn't work financially and it's not what we want to do. So. How does that conversation work to kind of keep people in the box of saying, hey, this is an archive, let's get it done and move on to the next thing and get the cost recovery that we're all looking for? Right. I mean, as you, as you said, one of the things you definitely point out uh, off is to remind people, especially, uh, you know, the users of the system is the primary people who want those features. And often the people who want to keep it simple are the you know, the IT directors, the VPs, the people who are the financially, they want to keep the money. They want to keep the system simple. And so um, often we'd have to try and remind the, the people who are going to be using it and say, you realize a lot of these features you're asking for, you're probably not going to use when the data is three years old. Mm -hmm. You need it today because your data is live and you're using this, but that's what your current EMR is for. But in the old data, all you really need to do is pull it up and take a quick look at it and find out what your 
you know, blood pressure was or your, you know, surgery results were in the past, but you don't need quite the same view, intricate view while you're in a hospital right now. Right. And when they start to see that, they start to understand that if they realize that, yeah, they don't need quite the level. Yeah. So I think the, the, the meta point I hear out of this is the dialogue with multiple people in the organization is important. You've got the day to day, whether it's a clinician or, or someone on the audit side, but you also, it sounds like you need a, a champion one layer up who can gently say, Hey, Remember the goals of the project. Remember the scope of the project. These guys here to do a thing. If we want to do other things, that's great. That's another project. Let's hit the time, money, and function box we all agree to. Um, and so I, I think that's uh, that's great. That's great advice. Yeah, and then just one last minor yeah. point is audit logging. So we also keep track of uh, audit logging, basically log, uh, logging every query and view in the system. So like from a um, if it's a clinical system of HIPAA compliance, for example, but every system has the same same things to be able to say who saw what record, you know, who saw my records, if I was a patient or vice versa, if I was a clinician, what records did I see? And so the audit log will track all that. So. Right. Yep. Yeah. Great. And we touched this on this a little bit, but uh, I know you touched on this, George, beforehand, but um, one of the things we always start with is keep it simple. We want to show all your data. We want to show everything you got, but we don't need to reproduce the entire legacy application, right? You want to, you want to get people quick, you know, you want speed and want access to that data and you want to see it all, but you don't quite need the bells and whistles that you had on, on all 17 different views of the data, depending on which per type of uh, person you were. Now you might need a couple different views of that data. Mm -hmm. So we say we tend to recreate, you know, what's needed. So, um, and the other one is the ability to export content. So, um, I mean, a specific example is uh, release of information from a, an EMR perspective. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, anytime you want to be able to get data out, to be able to export that data out, whether it gets it out to a, a, a PDF or something that has all the patient records for that, or whether it's uh, financial data and getting back a spread. Right. Uh, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the escape paths, right? They, 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 uh, the typically the solutions I've seen your team build is like, here's the five reports that you're going to use most. But if you need a six report, um, either your IT team build it or you can export it to CSV and slice and dice it in Excel or whatever your data modeling tool is or whether it's a, a document, maybe you print it out in a PDF. So, so I think that's, you know, it gives them, we walk away, they don't say, oh my gosh, this is the only thing I'll ever be able to get out of the system, right? So that's, that's I think, important. So the next thing I wanted to do is um, uh, have Frank uh, walk us through um, some of the questions and conversations he's been having with our with our partners in, in the healthcare domain. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Frank, and maybe you can walk us through some of these um, FA, you know, kind of frequently asked questions we've seen. Great. Thanks, George and Brad. Appreciate it. Uh, just to set a little light on some of my background, which I kind of think is important to the audience. Uh, I was the CIO of a healthcare provider organization for roughly 10 years. I've been on the professional services side, involved in very tense, intense strategic projects related around master data management and things like that. And so being on the buy side and seeing the issues you guys have, I can relate to the fact of what some of the frequently asked questions are being formulated. But the reality is it's much more expensive not to be compliant or support the uh, legacy applications than it is to get the job done. And I'll kind of evaluate or elaborate on that a little bit uh, moving forward. So cost, cost, pretty simplistic model. It's a combination of volume of data, complexity of the data, the availability of your resources to assist in understanding the data. A lot of these older systems, uh, it may be Bill been taking care of for years. Well, he just left the company and now it's been sitting there and nobody knows how to deal with it. So those kind of things kind of affect what the cost is. And we worked through that in the sales process to kind of get a measure of what that is so you get an understanding of it. Now you're, you're, you're looking at from a cost perspective, that also is kind of a, uh, a variable that makes up how long does it take. Uh, it can be go as simple as four to six weeks for an application, or it could take much longer for some of these larger applications with multiple instances and things like that. So it could stretch out over multiple years, or it could be just a single year. It really depends on, as we craft what our projects look like, what that project or uh, the application decommissioning schedule will be. And what also can affect it is, are we doing all the work for you, 
or are we teaching you to fish, which kind of can reduce costs and allow your staff to take over that? We can work in either model, and we're very good at doing both. Additionally, the uh, how do you determine the project uh, scope? That's really in line with the cost, which is uh, Brad touched on it on the best practices on uh, number three, which is how much functionality you're actually going to bring over from the new system. One thing we really are adamant about with our clients is the KISS approach, which is keep it simple, stupid. There's no reason in recreating your old EHR because you really just need the basic information out of it. So the, the number of screens, the search criteria, indexes that may need to be, and things like that will determine the scope. Also, the volume of data and the changing of complexity between instances. Uh, many of you may be aware uh, in your installations where you may have all scripts installed in 80 different locations. However, as you go from location to location, how those encounter templates are uh, set up within each application are different as you go from instance to instance. Granted, it's the same application, but however, when you change how that template works, that then becomes a little bit more complicated in synthesizing that data and getting it into the archive. Additionally, it's uh, the volume of data, I'll state again, uh, we actually try and target low hanging fruit and trying to get it going. So we get target those uh, quick wins and then let the project itself build momentum as we, as we move forward. Uh, what you need to know about the source data. That's crucial. Uh, it depends on the date or age of it. Some of these older systems, like I said before, poor Bill, he decided to leave and he took all the knowledge with him and there's no documentation. If there's documentation that resides, then that makes it a lot easier job for us to synthesize and kind of figure it out. If it's really crawling through the dark, then that kind of increases our scope. But thank God so far that hasn't been the big, uh, hasn't been a big problem so far, but we do find those one-offs where, it, and unfortunately, that nobody's seen the application or the application's been sold to multiple different companies. And in, in the instance of McKesson, McKesson doesn't, isn't even in the software business anymore. So tracking down those legacy uh, documentation and things like that some, sometimes adds to uh, the complexity of knowing the uh, source data. Great. Thanks, Frank. Um, and thanks, Brad, uh, for your for your insights. Uh, through the course of this half hour, as we've been chatting, we have had a couple of uh, questions that have come in on the chat. So I'm going to uh, read these out, and then uh, Brad and Frank and I will will reply uh, as appropriate. So here we go. Uh, first question that came in was, how long has Flatirons been performing data archiving and application decommissioning services? Um, so I, I'm probably the, the the old person on the team here in terms of uh, time at Flatirons. So we have been engaged in this general space, I would say for close to 20 years of looking at uh, uh, large structured content problems and how to migrate uh, content, whether it's in aerospace or financial services or healthcare, our particular application decommissioning uh, service, we did our first engagement in uh, 2011. So we're coming up on seven and a half years. I think it was in the summer of 11. So we'll be, uh, over over half a decade, so it'll be eight years this summer. Um, so the, the next question that came in is, um, how many projects have uh, we completed in the past uh, year or two? So I'll, I'll open that up to, to Brad or Frank. I know each of you have had some insight. So what, what would you guys say is the kind of the velocity and the volume of work that we've done over the last couple of years? So, um, I don't have the exact, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but uh, I know, I mean, I've been personally involved with probably at least eight different applications in the last year um, of being involved with. So over the course of the company, we're probably, you know, probably do at least 20 applications a year, 20, yep. 20 to 40 applications a year, counting all the different companies that we because we each company we do multiple applications. Right, and that's what I was going to say. It's interesting that as, as we get involved with uh, different, you know, customers, and as, as Frank said, uh, keep it simple, we'll typically advise to start with something that's a little bit smaller um, because there's always little bits of issues on how are we going to do deployment or how do we talk to a domain expert or access to the system. 
And then, the, you know, typically the, have a good first success and then move on to a new project. And maybe that next one's a little small and the next one's really big. And then there's another one. And then when we stop for six months. So, yeah, that would be my guess as well as it's probably about 20 to 25 a year uh, across maybe, you know, six to eight customers at a time. Um, so, so it's at velocity. Um, and I think it's been good. What I've noticed, too, is every one of these projects, we learn a little, learn a little bit. So the first one. Uh, we're looking at a mumps technology and i know you were brad were one of the early uh, folks inside the company looking at mumps there's a lot of different flavors of mumps and whether you're running on top of a cachet or not and so you know again you start to get some experience and velocity and things go faster and faster okay um this next one i think uh, I'll, I'll throw it for you frank i'll read it and then maybe you can reply uh, what has been your experience of the average time for an organization to really uh you know achieve the return on investment that they were uh, thinking about so we we start a conversation. We think, hey, based on the scope, you're going to spend this amount of money, and and then you're going to return. I mean, what what does that look like in your experience with the customers you've worked with? It's a uh, it's a little bit dependent on the client and their activities. If I'm working with a client now, they're, they they literally within two months can save two hundred sixty thousand dollars a year by just decommissioning one application, which we're no even not even near that cost in order to take care of it. So the complexity of what the ROI is depends on the client. Another problem that's out there that we're seeing regularly in, in the healthcare space is people are just not paying maintenance and support at all, which leads to a compliance issue, which leads to the unknown cost of when you get audited and are found out of compliance and start getting fines. That can be huge. Or security break-ins because the applications are running on a platform that can't be locked down and data breaches occur with the patient record. Those costs aren't readily known up front, but you can see some of the examples out there in the marketplace where it's millions and millions and millions of dollars in fines from CMS related to data breaches. So that, that's kind of some of the complexities of the environment that make up what the true ROI is, but it can vary from client, from a for two months to uh, a couple of years or could be immediate as soon as you get an, an audit and you start getting fined. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, what I hear you saying is there's a OPEX cost that's pretty easy to calculate. Then there's the risk factor, which when the risk hit you, it can be a, a giant six or seven digit number. Those things are a little harder to quantify on a spreadsheet. Uh, but but as you said, we, we've seen that happen. So, so we know it's real. Uh, one more for you, Frank. Uh, so, so what? Let, let, let's say I'm a I'm a partner, you know, with you in the healthcare space, and I'm pretty excited about what we've been talking about today, and I want to get going. Uh, what do we need to do to bring to the table? Let, let's say we're going to do our our first engagement. I'm going to bring in your team. What do I need as a as a, a clinician or an IT person, or a, you know, um, maybe I'm in compliance and, and I'm, I'm funding this because I really want to get my risk under control. But what do I need to bring to the table to make sure your your team and my team is successful doing this? first engagement together? It, it's a little bit of everybody, right? So it's the, the clinician view of it because they're the ones that have to use it and access it. It's an HIM department that they've got their use cases for it and then the user stories that we build related to it. Compliance has a huge uh, play in this to make sure that it fits into their compliance rules and regulations and things like that. And then not to be... Uh, uh, not to be misthought of, but the application expertise from the IT support perspective, a lot of groups have cl clinical applications teams that support them. And the more talent you have that still can participate as part of that will speed and help reduce the scope and speed getting the application actually decommissioned. So they're kind of the four main areas there. Right. And, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting um, from a governance perspective, because what I see with the teams is we'll have an initial engagement and they're like, Brad, man, you know this stuff. Just just do it. And let us know when it's done and we'll we'll do a user acceptance test and we'll be off to the races. And I think in some sense, it's a great compliment to your team. On the other sense, I think what we realized is it's much better when you work in partnership. And so, I, you know, I, I watch your teams and it's a balance, right? Because if you say, hey, we need 45 people in the room. Like, oh, gosh, I can't get all those people in the room. I can't get compliance and clinicians and HIM and IT. So I think I've watched our team say, well, we are, we're talking to compliance people one day. We'll just make sure, you know. And so I, I think you're right, Frank, that but it's all around the governance, right, of getting 
a touch point with these people so that we're doing the right thing. But um, also, we want to be a force multiplier for them. We want to provide leverage, right? We don't want them to say, hey, you have to come to every daily meeting with us for six months because they're going to say, gosh, if I'm going to do that, why don't I just do it? Right. So we, I think we have to find that balance. Hey, um, we're running up against our, our time limit, but we do have one uh, last question is for you, Brad, uh, which is, um, you know, there's lots of different data, uh, obviously different main operating system platforms, different hardware, different types of data. Um, what are your experience? So, so I'll put you on the spot here. You know, what, what's hard? What, what types of data are harder than others? And and why, you know, why are you saying, oh, I got to see one of these and I, you know, it's, it's a little bit trickier and they need to be maybe more technologies or maybe more time or maybe, you know, what does that look like? What, what's the hard data? Um, and, and why is why would that data be, you know, like scary or challenging? Right. So, I mean, it usually kind of goes along along with time. So the older data is usually on the older system. So it might be on mainframes or a. Uh, even a mump system, although those are still current as well. Um, but the mainframes are becoming, you know, obviously more out of date. And those are, are a bit more challenging just because the data storage is very different in that platforms. You know, we have tools to convert data out of these old COBOL databases uh, to pull the data out. But um, it's not as straightforward as, for example, taking something out of Oracle or SQL Server. Those tend to be Tend to right. I mean, relational databases got created for a reason, right? We started with file systems, then we're doing IMS, then we're doing IDMS, we're doing Codicil, we're doing hierarchical, right. we started doing relational, we started doing object modeling, now we're doing tuple store. So, you know, right, right. the older so it is, it's kind of like, well, it wasn't that good, or we still be using it, right? right so right. that's a challenge for right. you. So we right. just have to go through and sometimes try to understand that data model in those legacy applications is challenging to find somebody who's a subject matter expert who knows where that field is. They might see a field on the screen and where is it in the database, right? So if it's really, really old data on really old systems, that's sometimes tricky to right. find where is that data. So it comes back to the mantra that we've, we've talked about a little bit is uh, do nothing is actually not zero risk. Right. The longer you wait, it's sort of like not going to the dentist, right? <laughs> you know, at some point you're gonna have a you're gonna have a very painful experience, right? Uh, hey, that's great. We're we're a little bit out of time here, so I wanted to bring uh, just wrap everything back up together. This has been a, a great conversation, uh, Brad and Frank. Thanks so much for and, and all of you in the webinar and the Dallas Healthcare Council. Thanks for sponsoring us. So we wanted to give you just sort of three takeaways. Um, we think that archiving and application decommission are strategic initiatives. Uh, they're very important to your overall data management strategy. We, we see that with every almost every customer we talk to. And this is kind of just simple, you know, best practice. Start small. Uh, don't boil the ocean. And finally, I wanted to, to leave you, um, if you get through this and you want more info, this was obviously a lot in the 40 minutes. But we have lots of resources at our, our website, uh, www.fdiinc.com. So two eyes in there. And then again, our, 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 our customer facing really healthcare domain expert um, on the call here is Frank. So uh, you can copy down his contact info and, and Frank and probably has already talked to a bunch of you who are on the webinar today, um, but he's always interested in talking to new folks and learning more about what your opportunities or challenges are. So again, thank you very much to, to the DFW Council and to, uh, and to Brad and Frank. So I'll close it today and uh, everyone have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.